Awesome. And I think that the thing that really impressed me about Coach Parcells was, you know, he knew what he wanted. And he knew the, the personality of his players. And he took pride in knowing the personality of his players. And if there's one thing that I take from the lesson of playing for Bill Parcells and also playing for Bill Belichick is uh, Parcells was more of a an engaging, hands-on kind of guy. Belichick was a distant teacher, but yet you respected the hell out of him because he knew the game. I mean, he knew the game, and he knew the game better than anybody in that locker room. Okay, so 83 is a rough year. You went, what, 3-12-1, and one, correct? 3-12-1, yeah. So this is sort of that, that you know, season, because obviously, you know, it's the first year of Bill Parcells, but, you know, just adjusting to playing in New Jersey, New York area, you know, coming from the South, was there, is, was it a tough adjustment, adjusting to playing on the East Coast, coming from the <laughs> South? That's funny you ask that question. Big adjustment. I mean, football in the South is spit beer and wild turkey. Football in the North is this year when somebody makes a big play. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't used to people clapping as much as I was used to people raising hell and making a whole hell of a lot of noise when you either made a play or you didn't make a play um, and playing in the South. I have played before big crowds. You know, LSU holds 104,000 people today. LSU, when I played, Death Valley, as we call it, uh, was 90,000 people. So, you know, I, I was conditioned to being in a crowd like that. You know, what I didn't really, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, think of when I came here was there's a lot of culture to watching pro football in the Northeast. There's a lot of culture in watching college football in the South. In the South, the SEC rules football. Um, and in the North, professional sports is a big deal. So that was a big change for me. Um, I think the pressures of being a rookie and playing in a media capital where there's 13 newspapers, there's 17 networks uh, for television and radio. Um, there's all these different people and writers and everyone else you come in contact with. That was the biggest shock and, and probably the greatest shock for me to deal with and a lot of other players as well. Okay, let's fast forward to 1984. 84, uh, you make it to the playoffs and you face a team that will become your rival for your Niners. That was a great team, very underrated, great team, went 15 and one. Let's talk about your first playoff experience against those 49ers. Before you lost that game, I think it was what, 21 to 10? Uh, talk about that 10. game. Yeah, talk 21 about that game. To 10. Yeah, 21 to 10, we lose to the 49ers, but we turned a corner in 1984. In 1984, we beat the Rams on their turf in Los yeah. Angeles to, to go on to play the 49ers in the next round, which is the divisional, the divisional championship, I believe. Uh, yes, it was the divisional championship, not the conference championship. And um, um, although I felt we played well, uh, I, I, I thought we took an ass whipping and we got a lesson because of it. And that lesson and ass whipping helped us to be better in 1985. Um, and that's what football is. I mean, it's just like boxing. It's extremely humbling. You know, and you have to you have to adopt the uh, the attitude. As long as you're green, you'll continue to grow. As so when you think you're ripe, you'll begin to rotten. And that was our, our calling card as a football team: is not thinking you know it all, not thinking you're the best yet. Um, always being hungry, always remain positive, and always stay focused. And I think we did that well as a football team in the uh, in the early 80s in support of Bill Parcells because we really didn't want that man to lose his job. And it was talked about in 1983 that if he didn't have a better football team in 1984, he would likely lose his job. Yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, with the Los Angeles Rams, did beat the Rams in, in a wild card game, 16-13 against uh, shutting down no Eric Dixon. Uh, did a great, great job on that. So now in 85, you emerge as a pass rusher. You have 15 and a half sacks. Uh, go to the Pro Bowl. Use defensive lineman of the year. 
Let's talk about that 85 year personally and also obviously beat the 49ers this time, um, 17 to 3 at the Giants Stadium. But talk about your personal emergence as a pass rusher, as a player. That's when you things start to take off for you. Talk about that. Yeah, well, 85 was a breakout year for me. Uh, uh, for the most part, I was a little bit upset that I didn't get any uh, any consideration uh, for all pro or, or, or pro bowl in 1984. You know, my team, I helped my team uh, win our first playoff game against the Rams, the first time they won a playoff game in seven years. And uh, so I thought that, uh, you know, some sort of consideration would have been given because of that. Uh so it, it made me it made me work harder that off season, and uh, and to come back with a vengeance. And I came back with a vengeance, um, um, and I worked on my game um, all off season while holding down a job, working at the Meadowlands uh, and training every day, uh, five to six days a week. Um, it, it was good doing that when you're 23, 24 years old, you know. So you got all that energy and time on your hands. So, um, but yeah, that was that was the thing that uh, uh, that I remember the most about that. It was a breakout year, and it was a chance for me to, to say, "Here I am, world. You know, now you're gonna have to deal with me." Okay, so '85, you beat the 49ers, 17 and three. You shut down that West Coast offense, Joe Montana and company. Talk about beating them after losing to them the year before. Well, the, 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 the beauty of that is, you know, like I said, as long as you're green, you'll continue to grow. I think the growth of from 84 to 85 um, enabled us to be successful until we met a team at the next level that was kind of a step ahead of us. And that was the, the year that we lose to the Chicago Bears in the playoffs. Uh, we were the better team for for 15 of 17 weeks. And we learned a major lesson from beating the 49ers in, in, in 1985 to losing to the Bears in 1985 as they went on to win their first Super Bowl. Um, I think, I think that, that, that is what, what kind of was the glue that bonded that group of guys and, and, and made us so hungry to want to work a bit harder towards a common goal in 1986. Okay, so unfortunately the next game obviously went against a, a bear team that some, some people felt the greatest of all time, one, definitely one of the greatest of all time. You know, they went 15-1 themselves. Talk about that game, lose 21 to nothing in Soldier Field. I'll talk about that unfortunate loss to uh, the Bears. Well, I, 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 like I said, I felt that our team grew uh, tremendously from from um, losing to the San Francisco 49ers in, in 1984 playoffs to beating them in the 85 playoffs. When we met the Chicago Bears, we felt that we were an even match. And if you go look at it, you know, and you really go watch that game, if we had any kind of offense that day and, and didn't play 48, 44 minutes of defense, um, I think we would have had a better chance of beating the Chicago Bears. The Bears had two things that we didn't. Three things that, that, that we did. One, they had home field advantage because it was the coldest day of my life. Two, they had a defense that not too many teams were familiar with. And it was a defense that was played in the 1950s that was instilled and implemented by Buddy Ryan. So no one knew how to block that defense yet and, and how to deal with that defense, especially with the speed on that defense. And then three, their play at this level was three notches higher than where we wanted to be. We were playing here. They're playing up here. We need to learn how to do that. And so by getting our butt kicked in 85, helped us to take it to the next level for 1986. And that, you know, and because of that, you saw a different team. Okay, so 1986 rolls around. You have a great season, go 14-2. and two. You finished the year with 12 sacks. A very potent pass rush alongside, you know, Lawrence Taylor. Go 14-2. Uh, and a uh, game I want to talk about, one of the games 
and that during the regular season is definitely the 49er game because uh, that was on Monday night, down 17 nothing. You win a game, I believe, what, 21 17. That's the game. Mark Rivaro caught the ball. He was carrying the Ronnie Lott. Let's talk about that game on Monday night. Well, that, that, that game was, you know, heartfelt and a real tough a real tough contest. What we wanted to do was we wanted to go out and establish um, a, a mindset early on that we're the tougher team. Um, you're going to see we're the tougher team. And we're going to show you we're battle-tested. And regardless of what you guys put in front of us today, we're going to show you that we're battle-tested. And, and, and we're a lot tougher than, than you think. And I think that was the thing that 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 really separated men from the boys is we were able to hit them a, just a slight bit harder than they were want, wanting us to hit them, and um, and we you know we proved we were the better team. Okay, so now you meet the same team in the divisional playoff game against Forty uh, Nine ers, and you win that game by a score of. See what it was. Um, what, 39 to 3, something like that? 49 to 3. 49, 49 to 3. Yeah, 49 to 3. That was a book whip, man. 49 to 3. Um, once Taylor made an interception, Jim Burke knocks Joe Montana out. Joe Morris had a big game. You know, he ran for a touchdown. Let's talk about that game, man. Home field advantage again. Now, you got the home field advantage. You got the best record. So, talk about that. that well, uh, the, game, the, game, the game goes back to. You know, us playing at a high level. I think Lawrence and I had a big day together that day. We harassed the hell out of Joe Montana. I think I might have sacked him. You know, uh, I think I sacked him once. I think Lawrence sacked him once. I think together we sacked him once. Um, um, you know, uh, I recall them not being able to run the football um, in, in either direction against our defense. Um, I, I recall it being a tough afternoon for them. And on top of it, I, I recall them, um, um, I'm not going to say they quit. I will say they, 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 they kind of just, they kind of, we, we kind of took the win out their sails. And um, they didn't expect to come here and run into a buzzsaw in New Jersey. Whenever the 49ers had to beat the Giants, money time, they could not beat the New York Giants. Not my team in my era. Mm-hmm. Championship had to come through New York. They had to deal with New York. And that's what we liked about it. You know, we took the butt whipping early, but once we got that butt whipping, we weren't going to let it be like that. Just, you know, think you could come here and do that. So that, that's what was good about my team. Okay, so move on. You play the Redskins of Rival at that time. That was their nickname at the time. Obviously, they changed their nickname. But um, you beat them 17 nothing. You know, shut them out. It was very windy. You know, talk about that experience going to your first Super Bowl. Well, for, for me, um, we had a chance to set ourselves apart as a football team. We were the first team to beat a divisional rival three times in the same season and beating the Washington Redskins. And we decisively beat the Redskins. It wasn't even close, Rashad. I mean, we, we beat them at their place. We embarrassed them when they came to our place. And then you guys gave us a ticket tape parade in 1986 in the, in the playoffs of 87 uh, after we beat them 17 to nothing at, at our place. So um, I think the 17 to nothing game will always will always be in my heart because um, Mayor Koch talked about not giving us a a ticket tape parade if we won the Super Bowl. And he fulfilled that promise. I mean, after we won the Super Bowl, New York City did not celebrate our team because they felt that we were a New Jersey team. Mm-hmm. Even though, though American Express put up money to give us a, a, a ticket tape parade, New York City wouldn't honor their, their request. So we love the fact that New Jersey and the folks and the fans of New Jersey got a chance to share in, in our journey and share in our success that season. And uh, today when I think about that, that makes me real happy because uh, it was for you people that we played the game at such a high level. 
Okay, so now Super Bowl 21, you played Denver Broncos against the great John Elway. He had a great uh, drive in, in the 86 uh, championship game against the Browns. Talk about the progression aspect, getting ready for him. As you face Joe Montana, but Elway, talk about, you know, compare and contrast going against Montana and, and going against Elway as you beat the uh, Broncos 39-20. You had two sacks. Talk about that. Yeah, so playing Elway, playing Elway was um... – was um, just as much of a challenge as it would was to play um, a guy like um, a Mark Rippon um, and a guy like Joe Montana or, or Dan Marino. Elway was a big guy. So Elway was 6'4", 200, almost 245 pounds. Uh, Montana's 6'1", and probably 190 pounds. Um, but both had the same mindset as quarterbacks. They were treacherous and they were terrorists and they were killers. They knew what to do and how to do it and how to execute it. Um, when we played John Elway in the Super Bowl, we had saw John Elway in that season and we weren't successful. So we wanted to make sure that the next time we saw John Elway, he really saw the New York Giants defense. And, um, and I think that was the difference between them playing us in the regular season, and then them seeing us in the Super Bowl. The team he saw in the Super Bowl was the real team. The team he saw during the season were the imposters. We didn't show a lot of football to the Denver Broncos because we knew that they were one of the teams in the AFC that had a chance to go on, and we knew we'd likely see them again. You know, had we had the success that we had, so we were we were kind of ready for him. Uh, you're never ready to play a, a big time player like that in a big time game. Uh, so you got to work your tail off to make sure you're out front of everything in terms of the challenge. But the beauty of our team, we were focused enough, and um, and the players had a mindset that no matter what, we're going to make this one of the worst days of his life. And it's going to be one of the best days of our lives in terms of what we do in football. And I think that was the beauty of the 1986 defense uh, facing an Elway and the 1990 defense facing a Montana. Okay, now, that, that was a great era in the A's because you had three consecutive straight great teams. 84, 49ers was a great team. 85, Bears was a great team. Your team was a great team. But... Your team is kind of like it's underrated. Like, I mean, the 49ers, I mean, underrated, but people know about what they did. It's definitely the best. They highly celebrated. But do you think that team in 86 is very underappreciated, underrated? When you talk about the great teams of all time. Oh, I think so. I think so. I, I, in particular, I think our defense um, uh, more than anything, you know, because our defense, we won a lot of games on defense. And our defense, we, you know, we had a bunch of guys on the other, on the offensive side of the ball. You, you know, you, you barely knew their names. I mean, there, there was three guys on the other side of the ball whose names you got familiar with. And that was Mark Bavaro, Joe Morris, and Phil Sims. You know, I think after that, there was a drop off. We had midgets for wide receivers, but those midgets could play. Lionel Manuel could play. Phil McConkey could play. Stacy Robinson could play. Um, those kids went out there. Solomon Miller could play. Um, Byron Williams could play. The guys that we had, they could play. But they weren't these household name players. Uh, not like we had on defense. Uh, when our defense got on the field, you know, people could go, oh, well, there's Carl Banks. There's Leonard Marshall. There's Joe, George Martin. There's Andy Hedden. There's Pepper Johnson. There's Harry Carson. There's Gary Reasons. There's Lawrence Taylor. You know, they knew and could identify more with our defense than our offense. So the, I, I think the beauty of it was, um, as a football team, we knew that in order for us to win, our defense had to be clicking. And we had to be playing with every cylinder fire. And um, that was the thing that carried us as a football team. Okay, so you win the championship, you're on top of the world, but all of a sudden, 87 comes around, a strike happens, and uh, 
You know, he had a pretty good uh, season, eight sacks in 10 games, but you go 6-9-1. and one. What went wrong during that season? Uh, obviously, it was a strike short season. Uh, but talk about you know, what went wrong for us not, for not to repeat as champions. Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing was, there was the, the distraction of the strike. Um, the distraction of the strike, it separated, divided our team. Um, it divided uh, the league. Um, it divided players on teams. Um, you know, it, it made it very difficult uh, for guys to go to work, have work, appreciate work, and uh, and be successful at it. You know, it made for a tough time. It really did. Okay, so the next year, 88 rolls around. You had a pretty good team, but you failed to make it to the playoffs. The game that stands out to me was the Jets game. Al Toon scores a touchdown from Ken O'Brien that you had a chance to get into the playoffs, but no, they knocked you out. Talk about that season of failing to make it to the playoffs for the second consecutive year. Well, that season, that season in 88, um, I break my wrist uh, in a game against the Cardinals. And uh, I, um, when I think about that season, I think about the challenges that we had as a football team and the fact that uh, that team wasn't as resilient. That team took on more new players in 88. That was, if I'm not mistaken, that's the year we drafted Dave Meggett. We, uh, we, we drafted uh, um, a tackle by the name of Jumbo Elliott. Um, we drafted, uh, you know, quite a few players. And there were at least 13 new players on our team because we were successful in 86. You know, uh, I think that was the year that 88 was the year that Harry Carson was released from the team. Um, uh, so, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff really bothered the hell out of, uh, of us as a football team. And it was tough for us to overcome that now our team is going to move in a, in a, in a different direction. So, um, that's one of the things we had to learn to adjust to as a football team uh, and as professionals. And uh, 88 was one of those years where we had to learn how to do that. Okay, so 89 rolls around, get new players draft uh, Dave Meggett. And uh, the game that stands out in 89, fortunately, no loss to the Rams, Flip Anderson. But the thing that's that amazing about that season that stands out to me in 89 was the Denver game in Mount High Stadium in the snow. That's a hit by um, Gary Reeses on Bobby Humphrey, but also Meggett. I bring him up because he was a game changer. He's like an influential player. Like before there was a, um, what's his name? Darren Sproles and, you know, guys like that. He was like an influential, influential uh, kind of player. He caught a, a screen pass like on third and 30 something. Right. He a lot of yards in that game. But talk about that game beating the uh, Denver Broncos because that, that was a game that stands out to me in that 89 year is that in the snow, you, you win 14 to 7. Well, that, that was the thing to do. The thing to do was to go out there on their field and, uh, and, and take it to them in their place. They kept talking about the altitude uh, being a factor for them and us not being able to breathe uh, as well. Them thinking that we had a lot of fat guys on our team, a lot of, you know, big linemen that, 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 that couldn't play in that weather. Hell, I, rem- I recall having... Uh, one and a half quarterback sacks. I think I had like five or six tackles in that game, a forced fumble, or, or either a forced fumble or a forced interception, one or the other. But uh, um, Gary Reeses makes a big play on the goal line stand. Um, um, you know, that was a game of, of will for us. Our will was just that much greater than theirs that day. And, and, and those teams... From 1985 to 1991, those teams, those giant football teams, especially on defense, had a special way about themselves. Okay. Unfortunately, um, obviously you lose to uh, the, the Rams. Uh, 14, what was, uh, yeah, it was in overtime, 19 to 13, something like that. Oh, uh, the Flipper Anderson play. Yeah, the flip, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Talk about that tough loss because... That would have been like your best team that year. 
than the 90 team. We'll talk about losing to the Rams. Rashad, that team should have won the Super Bowl in 19. Yeah. That team yeah. should have won the Super Bowl because it was one of our better teams. Uh, yeah. uh, we began to gel. That's Myron Guyton's second year as a player. Greg Jackson's second year as a player. Um, our secondary was coming into full. It was becoming as good as the secondary was in 86. Um, our linebacker core got stronger and better. Uh, young players started to contribute. Uh, and make plays for us um, uh, defensively. We had a kid by the name of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we had a kid on a team by the name of Ricky Shaw, a linebacker, uh, uh, who became a great special teams player for us. Um, we had another kid, um, I'm trying to think of his name, Bobby Abrams, who also became a, a pretty good linebacker and a good special teams player for us. Uh, it carried over for him into 1990. Um, I just felt that, again, and I go back to it all the time, and I had this conversation with players like Phil Sims and Lawrence Taylor. From 1985 to 1991, that nucleus of players, I felt, could have won four Super Bowls together. Mm -hmm. Even though we won two, mm -hmm. I thought we could have won four Super Bowls together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, the Giants, they, 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 your squads were very, very good, very competitive, and y'all beat the best of the best. You know, the Redskins yeah. and, the, and the 49ers, I mean, it gets no better than that. Okay, so you lose 19 to 13 overtime. Now, 1990 rolls around, new decade. Um, you know, to a great start, you start like 10 and 0. And uh, the game that stands out to me that year, obviously, was the game against uh, the 49ers on Monday Night Football. You know, that was, that was the game, 7 3, who's unfortunately. Ryan Lott and Phil Sims going at it after the game, stuff like that. Talk about that uh, fortunate loss uh, against under two unbeatens. Well, that's the season that I was in Bill Parcells' doghouse because I missed all the training camp. So I missed okay. all the training camp. Lawrence Taylor missed all the training camp. 90% of our pass rush on defense was uh, was playing golf or working out or going on boat rides instead of at, at, at training camp practicing football. And um, um, I recall that because I was in Bill Parcells' doghouse, I didn't start. He ruined my consecutive starts uh, as a defense lineman. Um, I didn't start the first 10 games of the season. It wasn't until the Monday night game against the 49ers that I actually made my first start. And um, so I wanted to make it a big game for me. And I think I kind of did. Uh, they beat us seven to three, but the pressure we put on their offense and the, the fight that we instilled in ourselves carried over to them. They won the game because they scored more points, but physically they got beat up and they knew they got beat up. Okay, yeah, pardon, I apologize. That wasn't about on beans, matter of fact, the week before, you lost to the Eagles, 31-13. The 49ers lost to the Rams on the same Sunday. They both, on, your, your squad was unbeaten. They was unbeaten. So it was about teams that would have one loss. So um, I apologize for that. For corrections, those who are listening, you know, it was two teams that had one loss. Okay, so fast forward to the playoffs. You beat the Bears 31-3. Um, big beat time game. Off. Yeah, they talk about that game. Yeah, we beat the Bears off the Bears. I mean, I, I, there, there's film clips where Jumbo Elliott is taking Richard Dent and dumping him on his back. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's film clips where guys are taking Dan Hampton and, 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 and blocking him, you know, six, seven, eight, nine yards down the field. Um, you know, our offense was better in 1990 than it had ever been. And it just so happened that the Chicago Bears end up running into a Giants offense that that didn't forget what happened in 1985. Yeah, and does that, that game make up for the loss that you suffered in 85 against the Bears? There's the no same? question about it. No yeah. question about it. It was, a, it was a game of will, and I, I never forget one of my young teammates who I kind of mentored his rookie year. Uh, he was a center for our team in 1990, 
His name was Brian Williams. Yeah. And I never forget Brian Williams uh, played his best game against the Raiders that year. And he, 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 and I hate to say it, but he put a butt whipping on Howie Long in the game. Um, and um, I think Howie Long might have had two tackles in the game. And, uh, and he ended up leaving the game with a, with a broken ankle or, or a cracked ankle or something. But um, that, like I said, that team um, and the, that group of guys really wanted to send a message to the Chicago Bears that, you know, you, you saw a team that weren't ready for you five years ago. Yeah. You, haven't, you haven't seen us in a while. Yeah, yeah. We're going to show you what kind of team we really are now. Yeah. So, so a young Bob Cratch, a veteran in William Roberts, a veteran in Doug Riesenberg, a young player in Jumbo Elliott, who was a who was a beast of a player, and um, you know I, I taught him well as a player because uh, I practiced against him every day. So he had to block the best of the best every day and trying to block me and LT every day. So it didn't do anything but make him a great player. And uh, and and, a, and a, a, an offensive guard tackle that was a first round pick by the name of Eric Moore. So that group, nucleus of that group, really matured. And uh, uh, and I can't forget Clarence Jones as part of that group, because Clarence Jones was part of that group as well. Those guys became pretty good football players. Okay. All right. Now the showdown, showdowns, MC Championship game, nineteen ninety. 49ers and the Giants again. Um, hard hitting the game. I remember that game very well. You no know, hard hitting game. You know, didn't score an offensive touchdown, but you, you know, relied on Matt Bar to hit kick those field goals. It was not easy, especially the, the last one they they kicked. But um, obviously that game's known for your hit, man. And that's to say, I mean, John Taylor he threw a touchdown past John Taylor that was huge. You no, know, put you no know, break the tie at six six to thirteen six. But your hit on John Montana, I think. To me, that's the greatest hit I've ever seen. I'm not saying because you on my show. I always felt that way for years. That was the yeah. greatest hit I've ever seen. Because yeah. I, mean, I watched college football, Michael Barrow putting that hit on to Mac Van over in Florida State Miami game in 92, 30 years ago. Yeah, that is. Yeah. But that yeah. hit, man. Yeah. That hit, man. That's incredible. Let's talk about that moment, man. Because I need to make a play. Talk so, about that. So, you know, it's funny you say that. You know, so. We went in the locker room at halftime. If you remember at halftime, they were taking shots at our quarterback. They had took, mm-hmm. taken a couple of shots at Jeff Hostetler. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked about it as a football team going into the locker room. And uh, every guy on our defense, we made a pack. And if in the, in the realm of play and in the realm of competition, if we had a chance to, take, to lay out one of their guys, we were going to do it take the shot. Now, you go back and look at the football play where that happened, where I ended up taking him out the game. I slipped. Mm-hmm. I'm crawling. I yeah, never yeah. give up on the football play. I mean, this is what you teach when you coach a kid. Never mm-hmm. give up on the football play. Play till the whistle blows. Yeah, That's what I did. I played till the whistle blew. And when I saw him pat the football, drop mm-hmm. his head, and then lift his hand and tell Jerry Rice to keep running, I leave my feet. And when I leave my feet, I knew it was going to be ugly. <laughs> now, did I know it was going to be as ugly as it was? <laughs> no, but I knew it was going to be ugly. And, uh, and, and all I could tell you was, uh, was that uh, when I knocked the wind out of his sails, um, I was hoping for Mark Collins to catch the ball. And yeah, he didn't, the touchdown. Yeah, he didn't recover it. But he didn't recover it. Though. I was hoping, so hoping, because Mark Collins would be part of that highlight. Yeah. But it just didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. But I can tell you this, that uh, if anybody watches that football play and their coaches, if coaches don't take that play and use that play to teach young defensive linemen, play till the whistle blows. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. And that's the thing. It showed that you had a high motor. High motor. You kept, you kept you're persevering. Persistence. Persistence. Yep. To continue to try to make a play. Because then you need that play. 
Yeah. They, 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 they win it. Yep, that's what I did. As a player, that was always my calling card. You know, every time we played big games, every time, you know, be the guy to be accounted for and have them have to account for you. That was the deal. Yeah, so overall, um, they moved the ball, you know, trailing 13 to 12. And, you know, I remember, like, also, NFL films record you talking about, <laughs> we're a minute away, we're a minute away. Yeah. You know what I'm and then um, Stephen Baker made a big catch on that drive. Yeah. I think before made a big catch. Also, also Gary Beasley's found a fake punt. So there's a lot of big stuff going on. But on that drive, Baker made a big catch. Before made a big catch, I think, on that drive. But especially uh, Baker. So now it's time you know, for the field goal. He made some 42 yard field goal bar. He, he's definitely important. Talk about that experience. Obviously, you fell in, you know, you had your hands up. You well, fell down and you laid. Yeah. About the when, yeah. uh, you know, the field goal. Well, you know, I, I mean, I saw everything that I went through, Rashad, that whole, that whole off season, and then through the preseason, and then through playing and, and, and being benched, and everything I went through during the course of that season. You know, Bill Parcells ruined my consecutive start. You know, I had a quarter million dollar incentive that I missed. I had a half a million dollar incentive that I missed. Um, you know, that I, I could have made money to take care of me and my family, you know, and now I get a chance, I'm going to get an opportunity at another championship ring, you know, 